Greetings ATA community, welcome back to my second channel. So for those of you who don't know, my name is not John Lang. That name is an alias that I use in an effort to protect my identity. Today I want to tell you the story of the real John Lang and let you know why I chose his name as my alias. One thing to understand about the story of John Lang is that it is engulfed in rumors and speculation. Some elements of his story are undeniably fact and others are disputed, questionable, and unprovable. For the sake of brevity, I won't go into every detail of this story as it is extremely dense and you'll see why once we get into it. I guess the first thing that you should know about John Lang is that he is no longer with us and the circumstances surrounding his death are somewhat contentious. There are many who believe that John Lang was a victim of murder and there are others who believe that he was simply suffering from a mental illness and these two theories are not necessarily mutually exclusive. One thing that is certain is that John kept a detailed log of all of the events that inevitably led to his death, conspiracy or not. According to John, his story began in 2009, where he discovered that officers from the Fresno Police Department were scanning the license plates of vehicles parked in private retail parking lots and then detaining the vehicles that were committing violations once they left the lot. John claimed that he was a victim of this scam himself and that the financial stress related to this incident eventually crippled his already distraught marriage. John viewed this tactic as an unlawful and unethical money generating scheme that preyed on those of a lower socioeconomic status. In protest, John began posting his negative opinions of the Fresno Police Department on the Fresno Bee's website, which is the local paper in Fresno. And after the Fresno Bee moved their comments section over to Facebook, John began getting more interactions with his critical posts. John claims that he thought he was posting anonymously, but a reporter that worked at the Fresno Bee had leaked his name and IP address to a staff sergeant at the Fresno County Sheriff's Office. John went on to claim that within weeks of posting his negative opinions online, he began to be followed by officers from the Fresno Police Department. John recounted being tailed by officers, deputies, and Fresno personnel almost everywhere he went, and that his online opposition to Fresno's mayor exacerbated that stalking. Interestingly enough, I don't recall him ever mentioning having been pulled over or physically harassed in any way. John claimed that the officers had been following him, they had tapped his phones and that they were using information they gathered to deter customers from his business. But he never accused them of actually physically harming him. This has led many to believe that John may have been suffering from some type of mental disorder. Many of his writings are somewhat sporadic and disheveled, and John tends to leave out distracting details in favor of the bigger picture. If you read between the lines of John's testimony, it does seem to suggest that he may not have been cognitively sound. This is all my opinion, of course, and I am not qualified to make that distinction with any degree of certainty. All that said, it might be difficult to appear as anything other than a disturbed individual if you are subjected to the same type of harassment that John claims he was a victim of. If John's story were true, it would make sense why he told it with such a sloppy delivery and an emphasis on urgency. John kept a very detailed log of all the interactions he had with individuals he suspected to be undercover Fresno police officers. And according to John, the year 2013 was when the harassment reached a new level. John wrote obsessively about an omission scheme that he believed the Fresno Sheriff's Office and two reporters were trying to frame him for. And he went on to accuse them of attempting to plant highly illegal materials on his computer. I'm sure you can guess what I'm referring to. John eventually installed surveillance cameras outside of his home and started a YouTube channel called Lang Marine, which is also the name of a small marine craft repair shop that he ran out of his home. John began uploading videos in March of 2015 and posted 17 videos from his surveillance system that sporadically chronicled the events occurring outside of his home up until January 16th of 2016. Each video was accompanied by a description of the events being shown and generally also included speculation about what was really happening in the footage. Many of these videos show routine and seemingly innocent behavior by random passersby, but John often often concluded that these individuals were likely undercover agents of the Fresno Sheriff's Office or the Fresno Police Department. And some of these videos did clearly show police officers 
outside of John's home, but whether or not they were actually there for John is relatively debatable. One interesting video involves surveillance footage that John captured of a minivan parked on his street with a camera rig seemingly pointed directly at his home. In the description section of this video, John claims that the Fresno Sheriff's Office had been illegally entering his home when he left and that they were using an infrared thermal imager to determine whether or not he was actually home. There are two important elements to understand about John's claims here. First is that there are no known thermal or infrared devices that are capable of penetrating the walls of a typical home. Both infrared and thermal devices are based on wavelength measurements that can be limited by things like barriers, smoke, or climate disruption. Even if this camera was a powerful thermal imaging device, it would look a lot more like this. The camera in the surveillance footage appears to be a normal DSLR camera that is attached to a gimbal rig that is meant to keep the camera stable. Now that's not to say that this event isn't a strange coincidence nonetheless, but many have speculated that this was merely a movie company filming b-roll on John Street. And that theory does make sense considering that this took place in Fresno. But it certainly doesn't explain John's next video, which was his final YouTube post. On January 16th, 2016, John posted a minute and a half long video video that showed a man propped up on the passenger side of a van parked outside of John's house. The van apparently belonged to the Guarantee Carpet and Upholstery Cleaning Service. And the video goes on to show the man attach a document to John's neighbor's fence before eventually leaving. In the description section of this video, John tells his audience that if he ends up missing or dead, to remember this van. The following day, John wrote an open letter to the Department of Justice and the FBI, reiterating his suspicions that the Fresno Police Department were attempting to plant obscene material onto his devices and continually breaking into his home when he was not there. He ended his letter by stating, quote, and with this letter, I have for certain signed my death warrant with Fresno law enforcement. Three days later, John passed away. As mentioned before, the circumstances surrounding his death are somewhat strange and controversial. Neighbors noticed the smoke pouring out of John's house at around 3 p.m. and firefighters had to force their way into John's house because it had been barricaded from the inside. Firefighters located John's body inside his home and it was initially reported by some outlets that John had been stabbed several times including in his back. But the final coroner's report listed that John had sustained three superficial stab wounds to his chest, but the main cause of death was ruled as inhalation of soot and smoke. And John's death was ultimately ruled a suicide. It appears that Guarantee Carpet and Upholstery Cleaning is a legitimate company, but some have speculated that the company operated as a shell and carried out the hit for the Fresno Sheriff's Office. There have also been questions raised regarding certain conflicts of interest regarding John's autopsy. This story is extremely dense and like I said, I'm not going to go into all the details, but this is one of those stories that seems to take you as far down the rabbit hole as you're willing to go. It's up to you to find a reasonable balance between what you believe is true and false about this story. One interesting thing to note is that to this day, no one knows what John Lang actually looks like. He's one of the very few people to have interacted with social media without leaving a a significant digital footprint, and that is getting increasingly harder to do nowadays. There were reports that John had cameras inside his home as well, but apparently the system stopped recording several hours before the fire actually started, and apparently the last recording that was saved showed John brandishing a large knife at the camera before presumably turning it on himself. It is not outside the realm of possibility to believe that voicing a critical opinion of government or the police may result in being targeted, and that is cause for concern. And there have been many real world instances where police officers stalk innocent citizens. Some degree of plausibility exists within John's story, if based on nothing more than coincidence. What are the odds that a film crew would park outside the home of a potentially mentally disturbed individual and point a camera directly at his house days before his death? What if he truly was being harassed? Would anyone have taken him seriously anyway? John 
John Lang was no doubt a conflicted individual, and it is extremely difficult to speculate on his mental stability without some kind of objective evidence outside of his frantic social media posts. As I said before, anyone being stalked and harassed by the police may have had a very similar reaction. Whether or not there is any legitimacy to his claims, I believe that John truly believed that he was being targeted. But no one can say for certain if that's actually what drove him to his end. Sometimes it appears as though the variables of life align too perfectly for a horrible situation to have unfolded without some kind of human intervention. And other times, horrible events just appear as though they are a byproduct of our society. There are many lessons to be learned from John Lang's story, but for me, it serves as a reminder that almost every story is more complex and circumstantial than it initially appears. It's easy to point fingers and place blame no matter which side of the story you believe. But both perspectives reveal glaring problems within our society that should be addressed. For those of you who subscribe to the notion that John was killed by rogue officers from various departments, he represents a sort of martyr for free speech and government accountability. And for those who believe that John was suffering from an untreated mental illness, his story highlights many of the shortcomings facing America's mental health sector. The grander issues of both perspectives are valid and should be considered equally. And I think that it is just as important to consider how John's death can contribute to progress on both of those fronts as it is to figure out the truth of John's story. Some of the most impactful stories simply do not offer a calculated resolution. And it can be refreshing to acknowledge that the world does not always offer us closure. John Lang's story was one of the first that truly stuck with me. And using John Lang's name as my alias is sort of a way to create a digital tombstone for people to remember him by. As the psychologist Irvin Yalom once said, quote, Someday soon, perhaps in 40 years, there will be no one alive who has ever known me. That's when I will be truly dead, when I exist in no one's memory. I thought a lot about how someone very old is the last living individual to have known some person or cluster of people. When that person dies, the whole cluster dies too, vanishes from living memory. I wonder who that person will be for me, whose death will make me truly dead. Using John Lang's name is a way to ensure that he lives on for a little bit longer. And as long as I am alive, so too is John Lang. Thank you for taking the time to watch this episode and I highly encourage you to dive into the John Lang story and make your own conclusions about what may or may not have happened to him. Let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed this type of content and if it's your first time here be sure to like and subscribe. Once again thank you for taking the time to watch this video to the end and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!